Good morning. With all of that nonsense out of the way, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we turn ourselves to you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you also for your word. That you gave us this word that shows us yourself and also helps us to know how to, how to live and also shows us your plan. And right now we open ourselves up to that. We, we surrender. We ask that you would have your way in our hearts. So clear out the distractions. Give us a, a clear mind to look at the message, to hear your message. And as this message is very much about the entirety of your word, I pray that you would help us to see that thread that runs through your scriptures. And then also to understand it and be able to share that with others. Thank you so much that we can come here and we can stop a little bit and, and look into your word. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited today. This book of the Bible is an exciting book of the Bible. This is, if, if you guys have not uh, joined to, with, with us in this whole reading plan this is the time to start. Because this book is so clear and it is, it presents such a, a big picture of God's plan. Many of you have actually gotten started reading on this so far. Uh, it, we have uh, put out the reading plan this last week and you notice that Isaiah was the, the part of that. And my guess is if you have already read that, the first 10 chapters, you've seen some pretty uncomfortable stuff already. You've seen some intense things. You've actually also, without even knowing it, you've seen the structure of this book. You've seen it clearly. Uh, you've seen how this book works. And the structure of this book is very important to our understanding of its message. And I want, I want us to, to take that into note this morning. Take note of that. The structure is key to the message. Willem van Gemeren, in his commentary on Isaiah, calls this book the Bible in miniature. Now you guys are thinking it's 66 chapters, not, uh, not very miniature. Well, the Bible is 66 books, so uh, it is a miniature version of the entire scriptures. Kelly Capick said this about the book. Divine words come, full of truth and grace. They expose sin while offering beneath all failure hope and redemption. That's the structure of the book. Exposing sin while at the same time offering hope and redemption. Totally the way the book operates. Full of truth. Most of the time it's hard truth, but then also full of grace and hope and redemption. I found great conviction in these words this week, and then at the very same time I found great hope in these words this week. All along in this series I've told you that my goal is to give you the right glasses to read, in the, to read about everything in this book. And so we won't speak about everything. I can't possibly speak about 66 chapters unless you're willing to be here till next week Friday. Then we, we might be able to really dig deep into every word in this book. Even then, we wouldn't be able to. But I do hope that we will learn some ways that will help us understand it and its message so that we will read it with the right glasses on. We will start to see the structure and start to see the clarity. And I hope that it's going to come alive for us this week and in the weeks to come as we read through it. So let's look at Isaiah. We're heading into the section of Scripture that's called the Prophets. Now you will have noticed that we skipped a whole bunch of books. We'll get back to those. But... Uh, Albert spoke about First and Second Kings uh, about a month ago. And really this, the prophets, many of the prophets, speak during this time period. And the prophets were the way that the, uh, 
God spoke to the Israelites and, and their neighbors, especially in this time period. You'll notice that uh, First and Second Chronicles, two Song of Solomon have been skipped. It's because First and Second Chronicles is kind of a summary. We're going to go through that. That will be the last book that we go through. Um, and then to Song of Solomon, this is uh, a lot of wisdom literature, which we'll, we'll look at later on. Uh, but the, the prophets are in this time frame of First and Second Kings. They were bringing messages to Israel in, the, in that time period of the kings. We actually, in First and Second Kings, two prophets are talked about, right? There's actually more prophets that are talked about if you're, if you're going to notice it. But uh, Elijah and Elisha, they don't have their own book. Uh, but they do, uh, what they came to prophesy is uh, mentioned in First and Second Kings. And so the first one that we're going to look at is Isaiah. There are actually several that spoke before Isaiah. Uh, but we're going to try and move through the way the prophets are written out for the most part in the, uh, in the Old Testament. And really, these prophets' messages are similar. So Isaiah, who was Isaiah? Isaiah, literally the name means salvation of the Lord. As a note, I would encourage you as you read, if there are some of these funny names, research them a little bit. There's some pretty funny names and some, uh, some very deep meanings for these names. Biblical meaning, er, biblical names mean something. We're going to get to two more a little bit later on. But this is the message of the book. Salvation of the Lord. And so it's, it's fitting that Isaiah's name is Salvation of the Lord. Isaiah served as a prophet from around 740 B.C. to the time of his death around 685 B.C. It's basically the time, and if, you, if you're uh, taking a look at your uh, the history of it, where he was speaking, 2 Kings 15 to 20, and 1 Chronicles 28 to 32. It might be good for you to also read those uh, for context this week. So Albert spoke about a month ago on how the kingdoms of, kingdoms of Israel had split into two, and that happened right around 931 BC, and that was when Solomon's sons couldn't get along. And so they split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Ten tribes of Israel stayed in the northern kingdom. Samaria was their capital. And then two tribes, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, formed the southern kingdom. Uh, and that capital was Jerusalem. And so you'll, you'll notice that Isaiah speaks a lot about Jerusalem. It's because Isaiah was speaking actually to the southern kingdom. He mainly spoke to the southern kingdom, but he also talked about the northern kingdom at times as well. Uh, if you read in, your, uh, in, in Isaiah, he, he uses a different word or a different name for Israel, and that's Ephraim. So when he talks about Ephraim, he's talking about the northern kingdom um, of Israel. And then when he, he also uses a word called Ariel, that's the southern kingdom. Just for your, uh, if, if you're wondering where are all these names coming from. Around 740 B.C. is where Isaiah began his ministry. And really he continues until Hezekiah dies. Hezekiah was a good king who listened to Isaiah, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But then shortly after that, a king called Manasseh, he came to power, probably the most wicked king of the south, and he reportedly is the one that kills Isaiah. In 722... The northern kingdom falls to Assyria. And Isaiah talks about that. He prophesies uh, about the northern kingdom falling, but then it's during his, uh, his prophet job that it actually does fall. And then in 701, there's a guy named Sennacherib. He's the king of Assyria. He attacks Judah as well, the southern kingdom. And because Hezekiah is in power... And consults with the Lord about the threat, relies on him, God actually uh, goes, on, goes in and kills 185,000 Assyrians and thus scares those Assyrians off. And they do not take over Judah. It took 100 more years for the southern kingdom to finally fall to the Babylonians, which is also prophesied in Isaiah. So that's kind of a bird's eye view of the important dates in reference to Isaiah and his prophecy. One of the most well-known pictures 
that we have of Isaiah is when he saw the Lord. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. Uh, this was Isaiah's commissioning service. Isaiah was someone that never wavered in his commission to go and tell the people what the Lord wanted him to tell. He followed the Lord well. He also hated sin and especially empty or fake religion. You'll notice, in fact, that, uh, and you may have already read it, he really attacked those that worshipped on the Sabbath, but then did whatever they wanted to the rest of the time. That message, what they were proclaiming, what they were a part of, it was just empty ritual. A major theme of Isaiah's judgments are that they took advantage of people and hoped that their sacrifices would be good enough to cover it all up. They trampled on God's grace. That's a major theme. Isaiah's favorite name for the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. He uses it 25 times in this book, and it is only used five other times in the whole Old Testament. That's significant. God's holiness is important to Isaiah. He was also a courageous man. You're going to read some interesting things about him. He boldly spoke out against kings and priests, and he boldly proclaimed the word of God. One time he spent three years where, get this, he wore only a loincloth. This was done to show what happened to Egypt and Cush, two countries that were proud of their own accomplishments. In the final end, the Assyrians came and humbled them and actually led them away naked. It says in 20 verse 5, says they led them away into captivity with buttocks bared. That's going to great lengths for the message. Yikes. That's a courageous man. Don't worry, I won't get any ideas. But this was a warning to Judah. And, and, he, and he played this out in front of their eyes to not be proud like the Egyptians. That's courage. He was also very skilled in communicating God's truth. Not only did he do some crazy things to prove a point, he uses brilliant pictures to describe the truth. I wish I could be half a good, as good a communicator as Isaiah. And really, he was similar to the way Jesus would bring out his truth with the words that he, and the stories and the parables that Jesus told. Isaiah had two sons. In chapter 7 and 8, we learn about them. Shir Jeshub and Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Don't ask me what you'd call them for short. Maybe the second guy could be named Baz or Shalal. I don't know. Um, I'd actually give 50 bucks to anyone that would want to name their kids one of this. On second thought, you give me 50 bucks. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. I already said that names meant something in the Bible. These names are a great introduction, actually, to what this whole book is about. The second name on there, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, means quick to spoil. There's quick, quick to plunder, swift to spoil. In other words, you will be plundered even more reason why you should not name the child that. What this is saying is your nation will spoil. It will be plundered. And it will happen soon. Quick. Swift. It's going to happen. The second, or the first name on that is Shir Jeshub. And that one means a remnant shall return. Interesting. Interesting. Later on in the Old Testament, after the Babylonian exile, there's a group of people around 500 BC who go back to Jerusalem. These are, these are called the remnant, the people who remained, the ones who survived the exile. So the name literally becomes a promise to Judah. And that's what's described in this book. You will be plundered, and soon, but a remnant shall return. God's covenant that he made to Abraham. Remember what that is? 
Your descendants will be greater than the stars in heaven, or they'll, they'll, they'll number greater than the stars in heaven, and they will be a blessing to many other nations. It will happen. And that is what these names show. It will happen. And, and maybe a little easier language. This is what the book of Isaiah is all about. This is God's message to Judah. It is a message of judgment. God will judge you, Judah, for the evil that you've done. You will be attacked, first by the Assyrians, but then fully taken captive by Babylon because of your rebellion and your idolatry and your injustice. But there's hope. There's hope. Because God will bring the remnant back. And there's an even greater hope that God will bring about a blessing for all nations. Isaiah describes that hope. It's about exile, being driven from the land, but then also about restoration, coming back and being fruitful in the land and the land being made new. It really is the Bible in miniature, right? I want to let you see for yourselves in the weeks ahead as you read. But I do want to show you some of the main features and some of the main things to look out for as you're reading this book. As I was reading through it this week, I noticed that these, these things are kind of like waves in this book. There is this consistent talk about judgment, especially in the first 39 chapters. But then in the midst of all that judgment, there are pictures of God's grace and God's plan of redeeming the picture, or redeeming the people. And so it kind of builds up this, this picture and it, and it just goes in waves over and over. Judgment, hope, judgment, hope, judgment, hope. It builds up the, the picture of how terrible the sins of Judah, of Israel, of their neighbors are. And then it gives the judgment that comes against them because of their unfaithfulness and idolatry. You've sinned against the Lord. And so there, there will be pain for you, consequences of your disobedience. You will need to pay for your rebellion. But then suddenly there is this beautiful plan of God that gets explained over and over again. This is what will happen to you, Judah. But then God will bring you back. This is what will happen to the neighbors of Judah. But God will bring about a blessing for all nations, even the neighbors. As you're reading, see this progression over and over and over again. The call of Isaiah shows us this. In Isaiah 6, he sees the Lord, it says, high and lifted up in his throne room. We've looked at that in the last few months several times. Creatures are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Set apart, totally other. And Isaiah contemplates that. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. How can I come into your holy presence when the very things I say are so sinful? One of the creatures comes to him with a burning coal and touches his lips. My guess is that wouldn't feel very good. In the scriptures, fire or burning is a sign of cleansing, right? You melt it, you burn it, and the impurities are removed. That's what you do to get pure metal or gold, right? You burn it away. And so that's the picture and this creature says, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And then Isaiah is sent to tell the people what God has told him. Really, that's the progression, right? I am sinful. I am cleansed. And now go. Really, that's the gospel. But this story is not alone in Isaiah. Isaiah's very message is this. Really, Isaiah's message is the good news that we learn throughout the, whole, the New Testament. Did you know that no other prophet is mentioned or quoted as many times as Isaiah in the New Testament? Paul, Jesus, and others. 25 times Isaiah is quoted in the Gospels. This is by John the Baptist. You'll notice at the beginning of John 1, he talks about it. Also by Jesus. And then also 40 other times throughout the New Testament, Isaiah is quoted. 
Much of Isaiah's message is about the coming judgment for the people of Judah. We've talked about that. Much of it is about the seriousness of their rebellion. If you, uh, how many of you were here for the uh, evening service with John Dyke? This is what he talked about. This is the same thing that Isaiah speaks about. The seriousness of approaching God. The seriousness of our sin in front of a holy God. But then also the redemption that's coming. Much of the message is about the fact that these people are turning to idols. They're turning against the one true God. And for that, there's going to be serious consequences. For the northern kingdom, Ephraim, it's going to end with Assyria coming and taking them captive. In the southern kingdom, it's going to take a little bit longer, about 150 years longer. But they too will be taken captive, this time by the big bad Babylonians who by this time have defeated and taken Assyria as well. Isaiah warns what will happen. He acts as a pastor and tries to teach Judah the right way to live. But then he brings down the news about God's judgment. And really, God's judgment is a part of the bad news. The other side of this, though, the good news, comes when he speaks about God's compassion and his faithfulness. God is a faithful God. When God promises Abraham that he will bless him with descendants and will be a blessing, he will make that happen. It will happen. And so the message to Judah is you will become the slaves of the Babylonians because of your unfaithfulness. But because of God's great faithfulness, he will bring you back into the land and he will make a way for his people to be a blessing to the nations. He will judge them and purify them by burning away the rebellion, by putting them through trial so that they will trust in him and in him only. Isaiah's message is one of judgment and hope. First 39 chapters go back and forth from judgment to hope for Israel, back to judgment for the na their neighbors, and then back to hope for all the nations. And then even more judgment and then a bunch more hope. All throughout there is a picture that kind of forms the basis for this progression of judgment and hope. And I want to I wanna simply share this picture as I struggle to know how to, how, how much do I share? This is the picture that is shown. Isaiah chapter 6. Once again, Isaiah is being commissioned. The last part of that message is speaking about the exile to Babylon. It says that people's hearts will be hardened until there is only a tenth of the people left in Judah. This is what it says in verse 13. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. A stump. In other words, Judah, you will be cut down. It will look like a stump. This tenth of the people will be a group that remains in Judah. This stump that remains will be the holy seed in the land. Stump and seed. You know where else seed language is used? When Eve was told that the serpent's seed would strike her seed's heel, and her seed would crush the, the head of the serpent's seed. So Eve, your seed will crush the head of the serpent's seed. This develops further in Isaiah. Chapter 7, Isaiah brings judgment down on Ahaz, the king of Judah, at the beginning of Isaiah's prophecies. Ahaz was an evil king who put a lot of trust in the Assyrians. He even sacrificed his son to false gods. He showed that he didn't trust in the one true God. Isaiah, in his judgment of Ahaz, repeated his prophecy of exile, but also told of a king that would come that would be born of a virgin, and he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. He goes on to say that people will turn to their own dark ways, but then in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, In the future... He will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. 
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. That sounds to me like John chapter 1. Verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's Luke. In other words, Ahaz, your kingdom will end. A new king will be raised up. As if that's not cool enough, this is where it gets interesting. Remember that stump? The end of chapter 10 speaks about the remnant, the stump, the ones remaining, the ones who survived the exile. This is what 11 verse 1 says. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Have you ever seen that happen? where uh, you cut a branch or you cut a tree down and out of the middle of that stump or branch comes a new shoot? Have you seen that on a fence? Fence posts? All of a sudden, poop! Yeah! This is the prophecy of that holy seed. Much of the middle section of Isaiah is about judgment, but it also speaks about hope. Zion is mentioned over and over. God's plan for all nations is mentioned in this middle section. The importance of trust and repentance is clearly brought out amidst all the judgment. There's always great hope amidst the judgment. Chapter 15 says the oppressor will come to an end and destruction will cease. The aggressor will vanish from the land. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Chapter 24, verse 23. The Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. 27, verse 6. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Over and over we see it. Over and over we see it. Jesus Christ is all over this book. This book that was written 700 years before he showed up as a baby describes and predicts Christ so clearly. What a blessing. For us to be on this side of history, right? Wow. Wow. The whole prophecy builds and builds until an absolutely gorgeous last section. Chapter 49, verse 55, or chapter 49, 255, describes the ultimate salvation for Israel. This salvation is brought by a servant of God. And in many of your Bibles, you have a heading that that has a section called the suffering servant. This suffering servant would proclaim good news to Israel and actually go further and call Israel to be a light to the nations. This servant would be rejected and killed. Like a lamb being slaughtered, his death would be a sacrifice for sin. The ultimate exile that we experience even today, is caused by sin. It results in being exiled from God's presence. So this lamb, the servant, Jesus, would come to do away with that exile and bring his servants, those who put their trust in him, they would be brought back into the kingdom of God, back into the presence of him, back into relationship with him. And the amazing thing is that this servant who died raises to life and declares with his very self that we are right with God. What is the proper response to this return from exile? As God's servants, what is the proper response? Proper response is humility 
and repentance. That's the proper response. This is the mark of the true servant of God. Humility, trust, repentance, and then new creation. The true servant of God sees what their terrible sin has done. They turn from it and they live a new life, a transformed life, a repentant life. Really, that's the picture that Isaiah paints. Israel in the north, Judah in the south, world, neighbors of Israel, us today, humanity then, humanity now. See your sin in front of a holy God. Recognize who you've sinned against. It is the fearful, holy God who will judge and then accept Jesus' atoning sacrifice for you, which makes you pure. And really, the whole, the whole book comes together in the final ten chapters, and it casts a vision of the new Jerusalem, a place filled with those who have repented, who have given themselves to the Lord, and then also who have been called to be a light to all the nations. found it interesting in this last section It speaks about God's message being brought to all nations. And it makes mention of the islands. And I thought, this is strange. Keeps on talking about the islands. This be a light to the islands as well. I think what he's saying is all people need to hear this message, even those that are on the islands, even those in the middle of nowhere. All those places where they won't have heard about this message. Everyone is invited into God's covenant family. All are invited. This is how the covenant with Abraham will find its fulfillment. It is the servant of God and the servants of God declaring this good news of the suffering servant to the ends of the earth. This is what Isaiah is about. What a brilliant book. 700 years before the suffering servant came. It is just full, full, full of food for us. One of the things that we want to do as a church is equip each other to tell that story. This week, I want to encourage you to read Isaiah and really read it in the weeks to come. The prophets often are told, eat this scroll, right? (laughs) Eat it. Eat it. Feed on it. So that we will be equipped to understand that story and to see that story. While you're reading it, Allow the Lord to search your heart and expose pride and rebellion in your life. And then humbly turn yourself fully to Him. This is His plan. This is His plan. And it's so clear in this book. I'd encourage the music team to come on up. And while they're coming up, I want to read Colossians chapter 3. It says this, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. To me, this message speaks of what Jesus has done and God's plan, and I am forever grateful for that. So as we sing this last song, let's sing With that in mind, let this message dwell in us richly as we do this. Amen.